now prepared to comment on the status of the case itself. I think the end of the film set it uh, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. We went to the Court of Appeals, the appeal was denied, and now we wait for a trial date to be set mm -hmm. while her attorneys and her work through certain motions and whatever else. Mom, when a filmmaker knocked on your door, uh, why did you agree to talk and, and why, uh, why do you want people to see the film? Um, in real life, we are very, very private people. Um, we don't like being in the limelight of any sort. Uh, we were at one of our court hearings and my back was to all of the media and I was just ready to face the day that the court was going to happen and then go home and cry my eyes out. And I heard a little voice saying, so what are you doing here? And Irene was like, well, HBO sent me here to think maybe they might want to do a documentary. And my claws went out and my spine sparked, made my, my spines like straighten up and everything. And very delicately and humanely, Irene went through the attorneys and approached them with the documentaries that she's done in the past. And with that movement of her knowing that we're humans and that we have feelings, she took it to a path that made me understand that <clears throat> whatever her idea was for this documentary was going to be heartfelt and moving and not just see some e-true Hollywood story. How easy was it from that point on to gain access? Um, it was never easy to talk to Bill and Christy, and now after knowing them for a little over two years, sometimes it's still not easy because... Why? Well, because we've just got this horrible situation for three girls and three families, like always looming, right? Um, but uh, it would be disingenuous if I didn't say that an affection has developed. And, you know, when you have people who are so astonishingly honest, I think, as Christy and Bill were, um, and I have to say, they were that way from the beginning. I mean, I remember the first interview with them and also with Morgan's mother, and father, it, it was just astonishing. I think all four parents in this film, I think, uh, did not make the decision lightly. We didn't start working together until probably three or four months into the filming process. And, um, but it was like once they made that decision, they didn't look back. They didn't play, you know, well, you can come over. No, no, I don't want you to come over. I mean, once they made that decision, they really um, moved forward with me. And I think we always moved forward together. That was critical. And what can you tell us about Bella? We don't see Bella directly or her family in the film. They must have chosen to, to stay private. They did, and I approached them actually uh, exactly the same way I approached uh, the wires um, through attorney. In, in their case, I didn't go through the DA's office. I went through, um, they had a spokesperson, mm -hmm. a public spokes spokesperson. But, um, they chose not to be involved and so we just we knew that we could make a film that was meaningful and inquisitive with or without them so the, the film says she's recovered physically maybe not emotionally do we know how she's doing today you know i don't really because i i it's as really much avoided as, the spotlight yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you believe the message of the film is to, to me thinking about being a parent someday and thinking about technology the film was scarier than any scary story any slender man story uh, what, 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 is your, what is your hope people will think about this? Well, I can only tell you what I think about this, which is that I have to question their culpability. Clearly what happened was horrible. It was horrifying to this victim. But, you know, I think we spoon feed these, I think we spoon feed children so much material that you know, maybe Dr. Baird can talk about just their brains are not processing as though they are little adults. They're taking them at face value. And in this case, you know, this man is faceless. And I think that <laughs> the, the realm of possibility is infinite. And so, um, and you know, the, the, the tragedy in a way is that 
the most susceptible children are those who, like any artist in the room, are the ones who have so much creativity and so much imagination and so much what's called in psychology fantasy orientation. They're just believers, you know? And I think that those children are particularly susceptible to believing things hook, line, and sinker that most of us know is uh, far from the truth, mm -hmm. so. Doctor, I assume that we could have these cases before the internet, before iPads, but uh, has technology exacerbated situations like this? Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. Information is more accessible, and it's, um, again, it's easier to, to fill a void um, artificially in a way that maybe uh, 50 years ago, if you were a lonely teen, you had to go to the bookstore and buy a book, and on the way you might run into another human, um, or you'd have to strike up a conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I don't think there's anyone in the room that would want to give up the internet because, you know, my my children asked me a question the other day about something I didn't know, and I was like, oh, let's Google it. So I, I have a hard time demonizing the internet in here. If there's, if there's the biggest demon, in my humble opinion, in the story is the criminal justice system in this particular case. Um, the irony, I, and I've seen the footage a bunch, but I actually hadn't connected the words. When the judge is um, sentencing, holding the case in adult court, he's saying because these two 12-year-olds um, did this deliberately and were planning to walk a five-hour drive and meet up with Slender Man. So in his reasoning for holding this in adult into an adult uh, mind frame, he actually says, because I think it's reasonable that they thought they were gonna walk a five hour drive and meet up with Slender Man. So therefore, they're adults, mm. which makes no sense if you play it back. Uh, to, uh, I suppose, to the, to the parents, you know, you, you talk in the film about the iPad and your feelings about the iPad for, for your son. Yeah, I mean, I'm, th I'm sitting here thinking about access to information and an ongoing debate, especially after Tuesday's election, about fake news on Facebook. But that's about adults. What about adolescents and access to fake information, whether that's folklore or storytelling or lies or scary stories? I mean, it, Doctor, do you have anyth any, anything for us on how adolescents process information and how what the consequences are of access to all the world's information, including all the world's lies and fables? Well, we could start with gossip, because that's been around as, as long as people have been. Um, the point of adolescence, the reason we have an adolescence is to move from being children to being an adult. And the responsibilities of being an adult are radically different from those of being a child. And the only way you find out about the adult world is by other people or other sources of information sharing that knowledge with you and letting you practice that knowledge. And so um, depending on, um, I think it's a lot like learning language. So if you're an infant and you're in a home where Spanish and English are both being spoken, you will learn both languages. Mm -hmm. If you're an adolescent around a lot of kids that are really into skateboarding, the odds are high you might try a skateboard at some point. And that would be good for you. That would be the right thing to learn because that's your, gonna be your adult world. So I think we really have to appreciate the functionality of, of, of what adolescence is, which is a time to experiment and to learn. The assumption being, I mean, evolution's assumption being, the information coming in will be functional information, will be useful information, will help us be good adults. And in the absence of a check on that, it's, it, you, you honestly, you can't blame the developing brain. It's doing exactly what it was supposed to do, which is taking as much information as possible, see how much overlap there is, and you can find lots of overlap for everything these girls believed. They just didn't check all of the facts. And I think I said this, mentioned this in the film, if they were in a larger peer group, there would have been a couple of other kids being like, eh, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, you know. I. I'm not going to mention my adolescent crushes, but I was pretty sure I would marry one of them. Um, I did not. And most, I was told that by most of my peer group on a regular basis. But left to my own devices, I may have actually continued to engage in a belief that I would, without, you know, without being told otherwise, why would I change? You know, it, it, it's functional to believe these things. And able to find hundreds of people who tell you it's true. So Irene, uh, just on the film, where's all this video come from? Where all these photos come from? This is all crowdsourced, created by Slenderman believers? 
nothing you see is a reenactment. I mean, Nick, our DP, you know, he certainly shot in the woods where the incident happened, and you see those woods at times in a sort of impressionistic style. But mm -hmm. everything there from the opening scene of just someone stumbling through the woods, that's all found footage. And, wow. you know, and I think that really, to a great extent, just goes to further show how much Slender Man really is a projection of what we're comfortable with and what we're uncomfortable with, what we're scared of, what titillates us, what um, frightens us, this sort of collective um, passion we may have to believe in something. And um, so we really wanted to use, I mean, really, uh, Gladys May Murphy, the editor, I mean, she really was a curator, ultimately, of thousands of Slender Man documents and pictures and paraphernalia that's online and we just tried to and we actually had to continue every couple of weeks we would send oh. one of our production assistants like deep down the rabbit hole of, the, of Slender Man and the internet just to make sure there wasn't something really interesting that we were leaving out of the film and I promise you we did leave things out of the film because it's been a few months since we finished the film and I'm sure the lore continues to proliferate. So. And at the end you show what I would call fan fiction about a real-life court case about a fake monster. I mean, so you're going deeper into that rabbit hole, I suppose, as time goes on. Uh, to, to mom and dad, any final thoughts for our audience? Uh, what, what you want them to know? What you want them, if they have kids, to know? The one thing that we talked about when we were in Milwaukee was no matter how hard you try to keep up with your kids and the technology, and the technology is advancing faster than the adults can keep up with it, people need to be aware as cliched as it sounds, um, I told the audience, I said, this could be your daughter, your daughter could be your granddaughter. And you think you're doing everything you can, you're checking all the history files on everything. We saw no signs of this. Hmm. And we were in the history files on the iPad constantly. And here we are today. It's a, it's a horror story about a horror story, isn't it? Uh, well, thank you all very much for taking the questions. Thank you all for being here. Uh, they're giving me the wrap sign, but feel free to come up and ask questions afterwards uh, for any of our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.